Section 2, Chapter 6 Number 1 Sider ha'adun baruchu, shan hagas o'ilamai kulo. Hashem arranged that the management of the entire world, bein mashe the mishpat ha'maisim shel b'nei b'chira, whether we're talking about the judgment of the actions of man, people of free will, whose free will is actually relevant, uvein l'mashe ro'i li'ischadish ba'ilam uvri yosef, or whether we're talking about the management of the world at large, changing things that appear in nature, as we discussed in last chapter. It's done in a way that's very similar to a government that we know of down here in this world. And our sages have told us that the kingship of the heavens, so to speak, is like the kingship of the world. And that means that there are courts, there are court systems and courthouses and higher courts, supreme courts as well. With all of their ways that they operate and all of the laws that govern them. Hashem arranged various courts for certain spiritual matters. On known levels and known arrangements. Now he says known here, as opposed to in other examples that he's given in, in a few chapters ago, uh, where he says that the system is just too complicated for us to be able to understand. The human being cannot process all of the information, but we know the general concepts. But here he's saying there are, as a matter of tradition, now he's not going to tell us obviously what they are, he's not mm. laying it all out for us, but he is telling us that we do have a tradition for these things in Kabbalah, what these levels are, where they are, where how they operate. Okay, and is it understood that if, if we're talking about these tribunals and, and courts, uh, is Hashem the judge? Good question. Stay tuned. And it's in these places that, that matters are arranged they're dealt with and they are judged and decrees are upheld. Kamesha Amr Daniel, like Daniel said, The matter is decreed by overseers. Now let's address your question. Number two. Now Hashem makes himself present in all of these courthouses and influences them and he ensures that the proper judgment is coming to light that things are being done correctly and truth is being upheld there are some of these court proceedings where Hashem is at the front where Hashem is the judge himself like it says in the Book of Chronicles, I have seen Hashem sitting on his throne, and all of the legions of the heavens are standing at his right and his left. And our sages explained, The ones that are on his right are advocating for the defense, and the ones on the left are the prosecution. Now, the, the heart of the matter is this. We've already explained earlier. How much exacting precision goes into the judgment of every individual. With every person, you are going to find many different arguments. The Fisi by Shainas for various different reasons. Lies Nidon Ha Ishahu Lidrachim Rabbi Midarche Hamishbot. So that a person could be judged in a multitude of ways, depending on the perspective. Ubifrat Gamkain, the whole Maisa Umaisa Mimenu. So that's talking about an individual as a whole being judged. This is also true for every action. There are a lot of factors that might go into a person's decision with one action that he made. A lot of different motivations, different 
circumstantial elements to it. So there's there's this question that's kind of it, it's building up in my head, and I'm I'm trying to figure out how exactly to articulate it. But we've got we've got all these systems in place, and we've got angels, and we've got courts. And at first, I was thinking, why why do we need any of that? Um, but I think if you take that to its logical conclusion, then you ask yourself, why does the universe exist? And we've already covered that from perspective of what God wants or what he wants with the universe, we can't know that. Um, so to say that this system shouldn't exist in the spiritual realm or doesn't need to exist is just like saying the world doesn't need to exist. Of course, God can create anything he wants. But there's still this this thought in my mind, which is something along the lines of we see the court system as being kind of like a flawed but but necessary thing. It tries to find the truth of the matter, but it can make mistakes. And I'm, I think of, I would prefer it if the, you know, the one who sees all the truth just decided, uh, you know, on, on my salvation or what level I'm at. You're, you're suggesting that the institution of a system like this, this heavenly court, adds room for error. It, it implies room for error, yeah. Good. So that is, in fact, not the case, as we'll see right now. Now, in any person's judgment, there will be an aspect that's condemning. And specifically with every action, you're going to find an element that will condemn the person. There are many different sides to this. Because the truth is, the world is complicated. There's a tremendous amount of disparity. There are a lot of different perspectives. There are a lot of different elements and factors, variables that go into everything that exists. And it is true. And they all come from different ways. However, all of these elements that are true, that are fair points to bring up in a person's judgment, all of them, they are all revealed in the supernal courts mm. to their ultimate truth. And the entire legion, the aforementioned legion from that verse that is standing in the heavens, in those courts, they are revealed as an aspect of one of those claims, meaning these spiritual entities that are present in the courthouse are an, a representation themselves of one of these claims. Wow, Either so just like each blade of grass, each, each uh, mitigating factor has its own angel. Yes, every argument, every possible consideration that could be brought in a person's judgment, whether their action or them as a person, as a whole, is represented somewhat tangibly Hmm. in the heavenly courts as an angel. That's cool. So I, it sounds like the the ultimate truth is still found out. Yes. So regardless of whether it's done in a court or just done with a snap of the metaphorical fingers by God, um, the the truth is reached. Yes, there is no room for error. Everything is present there in truth. Ad shebein kulam mesgalos habechinos kulam until the point where every element that could possibly be considered is there and represented Nothing left out. The Oz, and then Then the matter is weighed in accordance with everything present. And the decree comes out accordingly. Now, even though all of the considerations are present, and it might be clear what the judgment might be, Ultimately, the judgment is handed down by whoever is sitting at the head of that court. Not necessarily Hashem. Hmm. Could be another ministering angel. But again, these angels are pre-programmed right. to act in a certain way. And they will have the truth. Yes. They will have the truth definitely at their disposal. And they will give the most fitting judgment. Okay. And if a person is in a 
court where Hashem himself is sitting at the head of the court. Even though everything is revealed to Hashem. He pushes aside all of the legions that are bringing forth these claims that are bringing arguments in accordance with how they are revealed. And Hashem himself takes judgment into his own hands according to what he sees fit. And it might be different. It might be that a person, let's say, could deserve punishment based on all of the considerations available in that action. But it might be that Hashem decides in his infinite wisdom that it's better to withhold this judgment, to override that and give a person mercy. This is where we get, right, this is a lot of, I was going to say mercy, but you beat me to it. It is mercy. This is the, well, the concept of mercy isn't just uh, meaningless grace. I'll be nice to you for no reason, just because I love you, favoritism, because that would be a distortion of truth. Justice. Of justice, right. Yeah. What mercy is, is we have an ultimate calculation here. We have a goal, and that is the ultimate perfection of reality. And so while judgment may say one thing, mercy says, wait a second, we have an option to accomplish something much greater than just enacting judgment here. If we withhold the judgment, we provide opportunity for something much better to happen in the future. Mm. And judgment can't see that. Judgment is the way it is. Two plus two equals four. So is there never a situation, because we know about the aspects of judgment or justice and mercy. Um, so is there never a situation where the calculation goes uh, that you end up with a worse punishment because for some reason that's going to positively affect the overall goal? Hashem will determine the most effective and the most beneficial outcome. And by the way, mercy also does as well. Sometimes mercy agrees with judgment that sometimes the punishment is the better outcome. Mm -hmm. And I that, mean, I mean, someone getting a, a worse punishment than, than the justice would merit for the same justification that we're using uh, for mercy. No one gets punished unjustly. Okay. The Talmud says all of the souls that are in Gehenna are crying out to Hashem saying, you have judged me righteously. <sighs> it is a, a tough concept. I mean, I, I'm not disagreeing with it. I mean, it's like the idea that you're paying for sins that you know for a certainty you've been judged properly for. That's heavy. Right. And that the punishment is not some vengeful attack, but rather it's for your benefit. Hmm. And every person is aware of that in the world to come. The judgment is true. Number three. It comes out according to this principle. Hashem doesn't judge the world directly from his own knowledge. Rather, he utilizes the system that he created, that he wants, that's in place. And something else that Hashem arranged, wants to be part of the system. That nothing in any one of these courthouses, these upper courthouses that we've explained, Nothing gets judged until not only the things that are relevant in the judgment, but their ministering angels are also present in the court. Because Hashem has appointed these spiritual forces, these angels, in order to oversee each thing that exists in the world, and these angels come to the court. And they give testimony for these things that they have become aware of. And then with that testimony from these ministering angels, these appointed angels, then the matter is taken into judgment. And we've already mentioned several times, this isn't an outcome of 
Hashem's knowledge or lack of knowledge, God forbid. Because none of these things are needed by Hashem. Meaning, it is not required that angels provide testimony to give new information to Hashem. Right. Hashem sees everything, knew everything that was, knew everything that will be. This is a system that Hashem decreed should work according to his wisdom. And it's according to these systems, these rules that Hashem manages the world. And it's along these lines that we have many verses in the Torah that refer to things like Hashem is coming down to see something, or Hashem. Be, it seems like these verses are saying that Hashem suddenly becomes aware of something. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's not true. Hashem didn't become aware of anything that he didn't know before. What they're referring to is the system that's in place that things are brought to Hashem's attention in court, so to speak. Not because Hashem didn't know them, but that's what's being activated now in the system. Mm-hmm. And these angels that are designated to oversee matters of the world and then to come and bring testimony on what's happening, they are called the quote-unquote eyes of Hashem. Hmm. Because they are the ones who are bringing to light these matters in the court system. For example, in the case of the builders of the Tower of Babylon, as it says in the Torah there, Vayered Hashem Lirois, Hashem descended to see. It does not mean that Hashem needed to descend to see. It's referring to these angels who are representing Hashem's eyes, so to speak, and then bringing that testimony back to the heavens. You know, the more we learn about this, the more it starts to actually become clear because I've, I've been continually asking this question to myself, you know, why, why do all these complex systems have to exist? But yeah, clearly there's, I, we, we can see and we can experience that there's a reality. There's, there's no aspect of this uh, that, that God couldn't just make on his own. So He's, he's got reasons for doing this. And as truly as we know we exist, if there is a metaphysical reality, a spiritual world, then, then of course uh, God would have set it up in some sort of similar way. That may not be as clear as it, as it felt in my mind just a second ago. But I, I know what you're referring to. It's once you know that there is a system, it makes sense that the system is elaborate and functions in, in a variety of ways in the physical world and in the spiritual right. world. Right. It's, it would almost be like saying, well, I understand that we need to exist in the physical world, but why did Hashem have to make air? <laughs> right, exactly. Like, well, I mean, it's a fair point. Hashem theoretically didn't need to make air, but it's part of the system and there's a reason for it. Mm. And it, things interact the way they do. But the truth is there is a benefit. There must be a benefit to this. And that's that sometimes the system can work in our favor in the court system because sometimes things can be overridden within the courts or maybe a book is not opened in the court for for a certain reason. For example, let's say if a person does not speak Lashon Hara, in that case, our sages tell us that a person is not judged for any of his sins. If he never speaks Lashon Hara. That's, that's a tough one too. It is. But the reason is this. It's not because he hasn't done any of his sins. And it's not because he's now so holy because he doesn't speak Lashon Hara, he doesn't deserve punishment for any of his sins and they're all wiped out. That None of that is the case. Rather, what's happening is when a person speaks Lashon Hara, speaks ill of someone else and criticizes someone else, what they're doing is they're verbalizing judgment against that person. Mm. And so therefore, everything that happens to a person in his heavenly judgment... There has to be an angel for it, and they have to yes, open that book. ...corresponds to his own life. And so therefore, if a person speaks Lashon Hara, 
they are generating that reality, a reality wow. of judgment. Wow. If a person never speaks Lashon Hara, there simply is no angel in his world that can open a book of criticism or judgment. He goes to court and there's no one there to read the charges. Wow. May we all live like that. Amen. So that's just one example of how the system could work in our favor. Why it's beneficial to have a system. Sometimes the system would not work in our favor, and then Hashem may intervene and override the system. But everything has its place, and it's all for our benefit. Now, you need to contemplate. The comparison of the lower courts that we have here in this world, our court system, and the supernal heavenly court system, the similarities end here. It's just in the concept of how they're structured. But it's not a true comparison. Because here in our courts, like you said earlier, we only have access to what we observe. And things operate in accordance with human behavior. Things operate very differently in the spiritual world. So conceptually, there's an overlap in terms of the theoretical structure of a court system. But the actual proceedings work very differently. He does not describe what those differences are. But we should just be aware that the similarities end at the theoretical concept of a court structure. Well, yeah, because in my mind, it does start to break down a little bit when I imagine like angels in suits arguing. Right. <laughs> Number four. Vihine, sam ha'odan baruchu es hakategor, vihu hasatan. Now Hashem has placed in this court system the prosecutor. And that is what we refer to as the Satan, this what has become colloquially known in English as Satan. Now, the word Satan really means this prosecutor. It is the force, the spiritual force in the heavenly courts which condemns and criticizes. And its role is to claim judgment in the courts, to prosecute, to bring charges to light. It sounds distinctly different from the guy with like horns and a pitchfork. Right. The Satan is not rebelling against Hashem, trying to undermine Hashem's goal in this world of bringing perfection. The Satan is, is performing a very needed role in the court system, which is to bring judgment. Hmm. And when he brings those charges, that inspires the judges to issue a decree. And it's Hashem's goodness, this is what we were just mentioning, is how the system benefits us, that a person is not subject to judgment until the prosecutor prosecutes. Oh, wow. So he's explaining where there's actually room built into the system for mercy. There, there are going to be things that you do. I mean, of course, you explained Lashon Hara aspect, um, but also there's going to be things that you do that if they're not brought by this prosecutor, then they're not considered? Correct. Now, even though a person's sins are known to Hashem, everything is revealed to Hashem, they are not held against a person unless he's prosecuted for them. Now, even with this, there are laws built in and there are orders and arrangements to this. Perush, the Kitruga shall makatrig. There are, there's a system for how the prosecution plays out. How it happens, when it happens. And that is what our sages of blessed memory have taught us. The Satan prosecutes at a time of danger. So if a person, let's say, puts himself into a precarious position, an actually dangerous situation in this world, 
that is a time where the satan chooses to prosecute mm-hmm. and say, okay, this person is now in a dangerous situation. It would not be miraculous for this person to get hurt now. It would actually make a lot of sense. Now is the time for the prosecutor to jump in and say, let's see what this person deserves. Wow. So very important to protect yourself, not put yourself into danger unnecessarily. And also what our sages have taught us, there are three things that bring about a person's sins being mentioned in the heavenly courts. He doesn't say what they are. And there are many other details that are involved in a person's prosecution. What are those three things? They are standing under an, a shaky wall, something that could fall down, standing in a position where something could fall on you. Mm-hmm. Number two is what the Gemara says, Iun tefila. Iun tefila means looking into your prayer. Now, that can mean one of two things. There are two different commentaries on this. One is that it means thinking academically about your prayer while you're praying instead of genuinely speaking to Hashem. Mm. The other approach is that even to feel looking into your prayer means that after your prayer, you're expecting that it's answered, waiting for it to happen as if as if you deserve it because you asked for it nicely. Okay. And number three is asking Hashem to bring judgment upon someone else, which makes a lot of sense considering what we've said earlier about Lashon Hara. So that in fact does bring judgment. Everything is measure for measure. If you ask judgment on someone else, will Hashem not bring judgment upon you? Hmm. Is that not the reality that you're creating in the world? Is that not justice? Of course. This is the reality you're creating for yourself. Wow. Forgiveness is a good thing in general. But we see here this is a good selfish motive, at least a, an incentive, right? Yeah. Forgive someone else because at the very least, maybe you would want that for yourself in the heavens. Finally, number five. Now with all the matters of these judgments in their general rules and their specific applications, chukim udrachim usudarim, there are many rules, there are laws for how they operate. In the times the judgment take place and in their elements, for example, that our sages said, there are four time periods throughout the year that the world is judged. And also that they said, A king comes first in judgment before his nation. And there are differences between before a judgment is decreed and after a judgment is decreed. He's just throwing out random examples, but the point is there are a lot of rules for how these things operate. If you're interested in these rules, learn the Talmud. Okay, I will. God willing. That concludes chapter six. Thank you, Rabbi.